very much. And I have the great honor this evening of introducing our vice presidential candidate, yeah. a woman who is from Providence, Rhode Island, yeah. who is claimed by the Maine delegation as a state treasure, who is a single mother with two treasures of her own, her two children, Rebecca and John, 17 and 18 years old, who are very proud of their mother tonight a well-known radio talk show host who used the bully pulpit not like Rush Limbaugh or Michael Savage to spread hate and us versus them mentality, but used her bully pulpit to talk about love and kindness and sharing. In fact, created a matchmaking network called the Do-Gooder Network, where she brought people together who were in need, with people who had a little extra to give. Helped raise money for scholarships for young people, helped get dance lessons for young people who couldn't afford them, helped get kidneys for dying children, helped raise money for relief efforts at 9-11. In fact, I propose that our vice presidential candidate give a lesson in American values to the vice president right now occupying the White House. that the golden rule means he who has the money makes the rules. I don't think that's the way our vice presidential candidate interprets the golden rule. We in the Green Party are very proud to have a woman as our vice presidential candidate. We in the Green Party are very proud to have a working class woman, a single mother who knows how hard it is today to bring up children in this society and has done it well. And we in this party are very, very proud to give a warm welcome to our vice presidential candidate, Pat LaMarche. television and now I've done it. <laughs> Isn't Medea Benjamin just about the sweetest, cutest little thing you ever saw in your whole life? She gives a whole new meaning to pretty in pink. Because her pink isn't just pretty, it makes pretty things happen in the world and we're very, very proud of Medea and it's an honor to call her a green. All right, I got a couple of things to say, and I've been dying to say them. <laughs> you know, I haven't been able to talk, and it's just about killed me. First of all, the jacket. You know, you're in Wisconsin, don't you? And you can get a cheese hat, or you can do a couple of other things. Or you could just look through the favorite sons of Wisconsin and realize that Liberace was born and raised in Wisconsin. <laughs> His Italian immigrant father, Salvatore, and, oh, yeah, Salvatore Liberace, obviously, and his mother, who was a Polish-American, came together to make a guy who could dress. <laughs> so in honor of Liberace, I haven't figured out where the shoes came from yet, but in honor of Liberace, we've got the jacket. Um, I, I wanted to say a couple of things. I was told to talk to you about ballot access. Now, one of the reasons I want to talk about ballot access, other than the fact that I've been doing what I've been told for about three days now, <laughs> I don't know how much longer that'll last, but... Um, <laughs> I think ballot access is the oppressor, bosser, man way of keeping us all down. And if Abraham Lincoln had had to put up with this garbage that we have to put up with, we would still be trying to free those poor, wonderful, and unfortunate slaves. 
But fortunately, there was no such thing as ballot access then, and a man, or, or well, I guess just a man, who had a conscience and enough property could just decide that he wanted to vote and could decide who to vote for and decide when to run and do it. Well, we don't have that great good fortune. Um, but in Maine, the Greens do. And we fought very, very hard. And we lost our ballot access, and one of the hardest things about losing ballot access and John and Tom and everybody else who sat through it can tell you about it, was the meetings we would have when we were trying to raise the money for the attorneys. Now I know 95% of you today are attorneys here in the room. <laughs> I have noticed that. But it was just, and we had some wonderful attorneys that worked an awful lot of pro bono for us because, you know, it was the right thing to do. But it was a horrible, terrible, terrible thing to be waging legal arguments and legal fights just to have the right to assemble, which I'm pretty sure is one of those rights, <laughs> you know? And so we fought and fought and fought and we fought in court and we lost and we appealed and we lost again. And then we found out as the judge that had kept denying us everything retired that a whole pile of us had worked to save Maine's forests. And uh, that's, uh, Maine's forests are wonderful. They're now the size of a postage stamp, so you can see them very quickly. But um, it, the, the, we worked really hard to save Maine's forests, and Judge Carter, ironically the same name as the man who was trying to save the forests, Jonathan Carter, um, Judge Carter had taken a three to four week vacation every year from the paper companies. He was also, he was also the judge who wouldn't let us have ballot status, ironically. So, so after all that, we did it the old fashioned Maine way, which was I ran for governor, they worked tirelessly with hundreds and thousands of other people, and we got our ballot status back. And quite frankly, I miss it. So Pennsylvania, you want some ballot status? Let's get to work. Who else needs ballot status? We're coming to help you. Iowa, all right. You let us know because there's nobody that knows what you're going through like the people from Maine do and I will be down there to help you as often and as everything as David will let me because I'm still doing what I'm told. <laughs> um, so that's the little, I, I always use a little bit of history whenever I talk because I am a history buff. I love history and I, um, I went away and lived in Europe and studied history some more because I love history and after I ran for governor I decided maybe I should grow up. So I went away to Europe for a year, went to graduate school, came back, hadn't grown up at all, and uh, went back to the radio, which is really a wonderful forum because people don't know what you look like. <laughs> which is a fantastic equalizing force when people call and say, what do you look like? You can say Tyra Banks and then they'll give you anything you want. <laughs> so we got kidneys and, and dancing outfits and everything else. And, and people gave us all kinds of, there's one man in uh, Maine who has probably given me $25,000 of his money to give away. Incredibly generous man, and, and truly a generous soul and spirit. And uh, last year we realized that it would be so much easier to do this thing we've been doing for 10 or 15 years if we were a nonprofit organization. And uh, that's when we started the Do Gooder Network. And the only reason I wanted to bring that up again is because Teresa Savage, who's running for uh, Congress, no, legislature in the state of Maine, and Tom Fusco, who is, at least, frankly, is king of Maine. Um, <laughs> they are on the board of directors of the Do Gooder Network. And when I met Teresa, it was to try and help this one child who needed a kidney, who actually did end up getting a kidney. And she wrote me a letter because she listened to me on the radio and we met and we knew each other about a year until we both secretly sort of stood behind a plant and said, are you a green? <laughs> Teresa was a green, and I was a green. She didn't know who the heck I was, because my name on the radio is Jenny Judge. And, um, and so we found out that not only did we have this love of people, love to help the poor, love to help the downtrodden, but we also had a love for the Green Party. And I don't think that was a coincidence. Now, I don't know how to put this politely, so I'm just going to blurt it out. The other thing I love about history is the most wonderful people from history, and I'm not trying to say anything like inappropriate or maybe sounding historical, but I love John Rensenbrink. <laughs> and 
it's really kind of cool to meet a guy who's made history, and you don't have to meet him in a history book. So if you want to have, and you haven't had a chance to meet John, and you want to meet a guy who's made history, you got to take a minute and meet John Rensenberg because he is a noble, decent, kind soul. I'd just like to give you a little bit of advice. Get away from him in less than 30 seconds or he'll talk you into something really stupid like running for vice president. <laughs> the man can talk you into anything. It's quite amazing. I remember when he talked to me in a running for governor. I thought, whoa, I'm glad that's over. He'll never talk me into anything that stupid again. <laughs> but actually, if I could just get over the fact that I really think I'm about to wake up, and I'm really afraid I'm not in my own clothes, um, I would just be okay with this dream. I'm running for vice president of the United Woo! States. because an historical figure and one of the greatest men that's ever met the Green, the Green Party, David Cobb, Woo! and some of the most wonderful women in my life who helped me get through of uh, running for governor and all the other things, encouraged me like Nancy Allen. I'm doing it because they believe in me and I respect them. And if that doesn't sound like a dream, I don't know what a dream is. So the only thing I'm really hoping is this dream doesn't end until we are the party that repairs the rest of the American dream. There's one other thing that seems to really make this seem like it's not really happening, and that's th that stuff in your past comes, comes forward in your sleep, you know what I mean? And when I was director of the Children's Miracle Network, which is a way to beg for children's lives because no one wants to give them decent health care, and that's not to put down the Children's Miracle Network because Lord knows if we didn't have people begging for children's lives, then there wouldn't be any solution. But it should really not be a necessity. Um, when I was director of the Children's Miracle Network, I went to St. Louis one time. We went to a conference out there and, you know, hung out in the arch. And um, I went to the Museum of Westward Expansion because I love history so much. It's just incredible. So when I was at the Museum of Westward Expansion, I saw uh, the details and the original, some of the original transcripts of the Dred Scott decision. And even to someone who was a history nut, I was absolutely fascinated to see that the reason Dred Scott lost his Supreme Court ruling was not because he had gotten into a slave state and he didn't have a right to get in a slave state and they were going to put him back in a, I mean, into a free state and they were going to put him back in a slave state. It was because the Supreme Court ruled that he was not a human being and therefore could not bring a civil, I mean, a, yeah, a civil lawsuit or any other kind of lawsuit. You know, it was like, they said it was like a dog bringing a lawsuit. So that second half of the 14th Amendment, what is up with that? We shouldn't be still fighting for that. That should already be won. And I know you've all talked to Asa for an hour and a half. <laughs> and he's going to keep on talking, and we're going to talk for him, and we're going to stick up for this thing because that's baloney. And we're going to have equality in this country, and it's been promised to us for a long time. And having a woman on the ticket's nice. It's going to be really nice when it's just one huge coalition of everybody and everything that makes this melting pot what it is. <laughs> and then lastly, I just want to tell you about one other favorite son of Wisconsin. You'll like this part because it's when I get to disappear. Did you know Harry Houdini was from here? Yeah. Woo! Harry Houdini and Liberace are Wisconsinans. Isn't that remarkable? I just think that's fantastic. So to the great state of Wisconsin and our wonderful hosts who have put on a fantastic show. Yeah. 
if I were ever going to have a dream scripted and the casting call done, and all, they could have worked on my makeup better, but and if I could have had everything done for me for this dream, I would definitely hire the staff from the Wisconsin Green Party because they have made this the most wonderful weekend and I am so grateful to them and I am so grateful to you. And I, and I had to do an uh, interview just a little while ago, and it was probably the strangest interview of all because the woman on the, on the phone from back home from a TV station said, so what's your goal? And I said, blah, 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 for our country instead of for our state. And that was such a huge switch, and I owe that to you. Thank you very much. Greetings, Greens. I said, greetings, Greens. Yeah. All right, y'all doing all right out there? Yeah. Great. Anita and I are going to tell a couple of stories about David Cobb. <laughs> I'll tell you about how when I first met him back in good old Texas, he, I thought about all the different words I could think about.